are secure and receive your son, who is the very bread of heaven. In your son's holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Just because we're in California, I thought you guys would appreciate this uh, quotation. I wish I could uh, fly Pastor Brady out here to do a retreat for us, because I've been reading this, this book called Eating God's Sacrifice in all fall, kind of in connection with our work, and this is a... Uh, uh, a quotation that I uh, found from that book, which sounds very California to me. Like certain Old Testament sacrificial meals, the Lord's Supper was indeed one of those holy things which had certain restrictions or parameters. It was not to be liberally sown like the more general gospel message. The general gospel proclamation was to be distributed generously like water to every thirsty soul. But the worship-oriented gospel of the Lord's Supper was to be distributed like fine wine only to those who had acquired the taste for it. So I'll let you, uh, you like that? It's I'll the fine wine. It's the fine wine. I'll let you uh, muse on that a little, a little bit um, as we go on. And we are continuing uh, kind of looking at, at uh, um, food, and particularly today we're going to look at the manna um, that is in Exodus chapter 16. If you have a Bible, you may uh, turn to Exodus chapter 16. I'll have it up here on the, on the screen. If you would like a Bible, they're on the back row there. And we will uh, kind of work, work our way through. I think I'm going to read uh, several, uh, several of these slides kind of all at once, just so that we get the whole kind of the whole thing, and then we will, uh, and then we'll, we'll back up and talk through it. Um, just in preparation though, what's, what's happening in, in Exodus 16? Kind of, where are we in the Bible? What's going on here? Israel is in the wilderness, they're mad like they always are. <laughs> All right, Israel's in the wilderness, they're mad and grumbly and confused, which is fairly typical for them and for us. Um, and this is after they have left Egypt. So this is after the ten plagues, which we looked at the last couple of weeks. This is after the um, this is after the crossing of the Red Sea. Shortly after the crossing of the Red Sea, in fact. Okay, so that's kind of where we are. Let me read it for you. They set out from Elam. And all the congregation of the people of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the fifteenth day of the second month after they had departed from the land of Egypt. So this is 45 days after the Exodus, more or less. And the whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the people of Israel said to them, would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the meat pots and ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I am about to rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day, that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. <clears throat> On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather daily. So Moses and Aaron said to all the people of Israel, At evening you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your grumbling against the Lord. For what are we that you grumble against us? And Moses said, When the Lord gives you in the evening meat to eat, and in the morning bread to the full, because the Lord has heard your grumbling, that you grumble against him, what are we? Your grumbling is not against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, Come near before the Lord, for he has heard your grumbling. And as soon as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. And the Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumbling of the people of Israel. Say to them, at twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread, 
then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. In the evening, quail came up and covered the camp, and in the morning, dew lay around the camp. And when the dew had gone up, there was on the face of the wilderness a fine, flake-like thing, fine as frost on the ground. When the people of Israel saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, It is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. All right. So that's kind of the that's the event as we as we get it here. Um, let me see here. Let's go. Let's go here. So let me make a few observations, and then you guys can completely distract me. Um, number one, receiving the manna is a matter of faith. Did we hear the word manna in there, by the way? Was it, was it actually in, in any of those verses? I don't think so. It's called that later, but it isn't. The closest we get there is that the, the Hebrew, uh, the question that the people ask Moses is, what is it? And if, you were, and if you were a good Israelite, the way that you would say that is, mana. <laughs> That's what manna means. What is it? So, uh, just in case you think it had a more <coughs> pious meaning, it doesn't. Um, receiving the manna is a matter of faith. How is it a manner of faith? Shows up every morning. They take two portions on Friday, which we'll get to in a minute. Why is it a matter of faith? They don't hoard it. They don't hoard it. Yeah, they get it every day. And no more than a day's worth every day. Pardon me? Kind of like Weight Watchers. Kind of like Weight Watchers. I was going to say, kind of like my checkbook, but I suppose that's not so good. Um, so every day they had to learn how to trust that God was going to be there tomorrow. And that God was going to provide for them tomorrow. Um, you may remember when we were doing our uh, our study of Exodus that I said that the 40 years in the wilderness was basically God's 40-year lesson on listening skills for the people of Israel. That they had to learn how to listen and hear God's word and trust that when God said something, it was true. And that it was something that you could rely on along the way. Is everybody, everybody uh, with me so far? Any questions at this at this point? So, number one, the manna was a matter of faith that they had to hear and receive and know and kind of learn to trust that it was going to be there the next day along the way. How it was received when it was received, and by whom it was received, are all determined by God. <laughs> okay? Now this is important, because if it is a gift from God, and God is the giver of the gift, therefore, God determines what it is, when you get it, where you get it, how you get it, and we could probably add why, who gets it and why you get it all along the way. That it is God's meal, not, not something that they do. Why is that important? This just goes right back to number one there. That this is about them learning how to trust that God is going to provide for them. When he will, where he will, how he will. Now, it's very easy for us, I think, when we talk about faith, to, to make faith into, into an abstraction. That is, to kind of make faith into, like, I don't know, an idea or a philosophy or a concept or something like that. But faith becomes much harder... <coughs> 
when you get to the point of, so, what are we going to have for breakfast tomorrow? Mana. What is it? That's kind of the concrete character of faith. That, that faith relies on what you can't see. Now they go to bed every night, and they don't have a thing for breakfast. They get up in the morning, there it is. Um, that, this is why, by the way, there are a lot of tighter connections between this episode and our Lord giving the Lord's Prayer. Because in the Lord's Prayer, um, we usually translate, give us this day our daily bread. You could also, and maybe even more rightly translate it, give us day by day our bread. Which sort of, I think, kind of puts a little different different uh, take on it. That, that we trust that God is going to provide for us each day, and that that is a that that is something that we have to relearn each day because we are debts spiritually. Just don't learn. So like the like the Israelites in the wilderness with their forty years. So too we we learn to pray. Give us day by day our bread. Teach us to receive you. Everybody here? Everybody uh, with me? Okay. The problems for the people of Israel begin to happen when they try to receive it on their own terms. Okay? That is, when the people of Israel start to get stressed <laughs> about that when <laughs> and how is when their trust begins to erode. Their trust in God begins to erode. And how their trust in God erodes is very, very concrete. This is not them sitting down over a cup of coffee arguing whether or not God is going to provide for them. What do they do? What do they do? They say more. They try to say more. They try they try to hoard what God gives. So they try to change the how it was received day by day and the when it was received. And that's when things start to mess up for them. Which, which too, I, I would argue, goes to the heart of, of the nature of faith. Faith means trusting in what God has given us in His Son, and how God gives His Son, when is that received, by whom is it received, and why. That that's the nature of faith. And it's when we start to turn these things on their ear, and kind of try to make faith into something else, that things really get get very, very messy. Now, what I, what I really love about this, with this, with this manna, is how incredibly concrete all of this stuff is. It's very easy when you start talking about faith to just, you know, to just kind of lose it, basically. It doesn't have anything to do with real life. This is just, you know, this is, this is unreal talk. This is just talking about ideas. But here it is extremely concrete. Any other questions or observations on that? I don't know if you guys are sleepy, if I'm not making any sense, or if I'm just brilliant. <laughs> I'm sure. I find that so incredibly unlikely. Now, if you if you look at kind of how we think of the story of Exodus and, and kind of all of this stuff, manna really is a pretty important thing for us, I would argue. That, that I mean, and we're going to
going to look at, at uh, every use of manna in the hymnal. It won't take us that long, but uh, we're going to look at them in a minute. But what I found very interest, interesting in studying for this, studying for this, preparing for this, is that there really, manna is not mentioned very often in the Bible. Not nearly as often as you might think. Um, we get, a, we get a, a mention of it in Numbers, when the people are complaining. I'm going to have, have uh, you guys look up a couple verses in a minute. We get it in Deuteronomy, when Moses is kind of retelling the story of the Exodus. We get it we get it in Joshua as kind of a note that when they got to the promised land and when and when they started to eat of the bounty of the promised land, the manna ceased. Okay? So that's Joshua 5. Nehemiah 9.20. I'm going to give you a couple verses and have, a, and have some people look them up for us. Uh, can I have someone look up Nehemiah 9.20 for us? Gloria's got that one. Um, the next one is Psalm 78, 24. Can someone else look up that one for me? Stacy, you got that? Uh, John 6, we'll probably look at it in a minute. Revelation 2, 17 is the last one. Okay. Can you find it, Gloria? I know. We don't spend a lot of time in Nehemiah.
hymn of praise to the Trinity. This is the third, this is the Holy Ghost verse. Third verse. How, what does manna mean here? In this verse, in this verse, in this stanza. Yeah, it kind of kind of means spiritual food. We get eternal, we get this word endless here. It, it certainly seems to have a have a sense of that. Um, this is in the context of, of the Holy Ghost. So we get some kind of third article of the Creed talk here, regeneration. Of course, it's baptism talk. Regeneration literally means rebirth. Um, so we get rebirth and baptism. We get faith. We get... This is sort of an interesting one. And us unto the bridegroom brought. I would argue that that's that that is um, dancing around the Lord's supper. That that is that that has not literally, um, but that that is implying the Lord's supper. Bridegroom means heavenly banquet. So it means Lord's supper stuff. Barbara. In, in that hymn, manna is the uh, meaning of our faith. Yeah, and, and that I do, and I agree. Here, what this really means is God's going to provide for everything that we need for now and for eternity. Now and forever. But I think that that context is really important. Okay, so there's one. Let's look at another one. An Easter hymn. Praise me, Christ. Thirst with living waters. 
Mana. What is it? What is it? Christ. The daily manna given. Which gets us at that, give us this day our daily bread language there. So, and this, this verse, really that whole hymn, but this verse especially um, references John's gospel, 3, 4, 5, 6, a lot. I mean, we get, we get the, uh, the living bread from heaven. We, we get food for body, food for soul, which is an interesting little line because that's, that's highlighting that God, God provides and cares for the whole person. That this isn't just spiritual talk, whatever that means, but that this is, but that this is body and soul. Um, we get this manna daily, nourish, strengthen, make us whole, feed us with the food of heaven, foretaste of the feast to be. So there's this. Here's your. You ready for your 57 cent word for today? The, the word is. This is eschatological talk. It's such a fun word. You ever seen, uh, seen a eschaton? You know what, what's eschaton here? Oh, well, that's a nursing home. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, we would have called it a, a nursing home in the day or assisted living. Yeah, independent. But I, it, I'm just, first of all, you guys know I'm just a bad person. Because every time I see that, eschaton literally means end things. <laughs> That's what the word means. So, so eschaton is the place for the end things, um, as an independent living set. But this is <laughs> eschatological talk here. Is strengthen us, make us whole, feed us with the food of heaven, foretaste the feast to be. So this is now and, and future. Now and what is to come. It's kind of all, all wrapped up in there. And then this living water, that's the Jesus talking to the Samaritan woman. Give us this, give us this living water. So here, manna, manna is explicitly Jesus. Christ, the daily manna gift. <coughs> Let's do it. Oh, and by the way, what uh, what section of the hymnal do you think that is? This is a little bit more obscure. It's not Easter. It's not the Lord's Supper. This is in the Redeemer section, which I think is the section of hymns that have to do with Jesus that we don't really know where else to put. <laughs> I think. Who wrote that? It's modern. I think it may have been written by Steve Mueller, who is a professor at Concordia Irvine. I'd have to look at him and we'll see. But yeah, that Christ, the Word of God incarnate, is that hymn. It's a great hymn. Fantastic hymn. All right, let's do another one. This one's for you Germans. From the habitations of green sea,
So what? So what is manna in this in this verse? It's the manna from the Exodus. This seems to be much more of a historical that this is referring to the event and how the event how the event happened. That was my that was my read of it as well. I know that was a, a very underwhelming conclusion to, <laughs> to, to the one that we sing three times. <laughs> well, you got to sing the band. Yes. Yeah. All right. This one we know. It makes the wounded spirit. Me 
like to make another comment before the end of this session, and that is going back to Exodus 16 text. Um, I have to say this because I'm now a member of this congregation, but I think we are very blessed to have a pastor who leads us in the depth of, of not only the theology of our faith, but the scriptures themselves. And so we are better equipped to speak to our neighbors, uh, uh, and particularly our relatives, about why why Lutherans are so strange in certain things. Yes. And uh, I think with all of this background, eventually we'll get to the point where we will be able to say to those who say, how come you Lutherans think you're better than us? Well, we don't. Um, we, we are all sinners. Uh, but you don't let me come to communion. But that's because we love you. And when we get to that point, then I, I probably won't be here at this probably. Yeah, but You'll uh, probably be in ten. Well, I mean, depending on how long it takes us, it might be in heaven, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Well, and that, and that is, this is not a, uh, this is not a class on closure. That is not that, that is not the intention. Um, but there's no question that the issue of close communion, who may come to the altar and why, that that is continually one that that just kind of pokes at us. It does does for me and I'm the pastor. And and so in order for us to understand our own practice. And why, where, and how do they, all these things fit? We've, we've got to delve into the scriptures to see what they actually teach. And that is kind of a, that is the whole point. I'll pay you later. <laughs> all right. Um, since since we've only got a couple more minutes, I don't want to try to do um, uh, do John six. I think it'll take us more than two minutes. To do John chapter six, um, but what I wanted to to really highlight for you here is this is this, um, this first of all looking at this this chapter next to the sixteen that that is unquestionably a chapter about faith that the children of Israel are, are grumbling. Uh, and I didn't even uh, I didn't even go off on my uh, my favorite line in Exodus or one of them of uh, the uh, longing for the flesh pots of Egypt. That's such a great one. Um, but God provides for them what they need when they need it, as He gives it, to whom He gives it, and why He gives it. That God gives all of these things to them and delivers it exactly as they need it. Which is precisely what God continues to do for us today. Not only with our uh, daily bread giving us food for the body, but our daily, but our daily bread giving us his son Jesus Christ in the sacrament. And that, that is what continues to strengthen and preserve us, that those things go together. Yeah. This morning in the epistle reading, I was so struck, and, and this, it reminded me, I was so struck by kind of what you're saying now, and how God, his fullness of time, that, you know, when we talk about Christmas and Jesus came at the fullness of time, it was exactly when it needed it. And in the epistle reading, it says, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some kind of slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. And that same concept of he gives us what we need, and it isn't because he doesn't, he has forgotten us. Right. It isn't because that he hasn't come again and brought us all home. It's because he does love us, but not just us but loves all people and wants all people to receive his gifts. And that was such a wonderful blessing. He 
here. Yep. You know, and we are free. So easily forget that. And, 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 and it's really, really yeah, it's amazing. A, it's a powerful you know. there. <laughs> Jerry. Uh, in line with what Catherine said, and um, you mentioned eschaton, uh, on Monday night, our preschool children are going to be sharing joy and witnessing, uh, caroling to the um, aged community at Eschaton on Barton Road. Wonderful. And if you want to know any details, I don't know them, but I bet Gloria does. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, wonderful. Thank you very much for that reminder. I forgot that. I think that we are good for good for today. We will. I think just because of, of this conversation, I think I was planning on, on doing some other things, but I think we have to do John 6 next week. So so next week and probably the week after, uh, we will do we will look at John 6, which is the feeding of the 5,000 and then Jesus' uh, discourse on, his, it's called the Word of Heaven discourse. So we'll look at John 6. If you want to read, uh, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest John 6 in preparation. Fantastic. Let's close with the benediction. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit.